So hello, everybody, and welcome. Thanks to everybody that's here uh, in the auditorium with us today, as well as everybody that's out there online. My name is Rob Coble, and uh, I represent the Career Development Department here at Full Sail. Uh, I get the pleasure of working with uh, uh, all of the game and technology degrees. I know a lot of you guys out there, so thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, we're gonna do the panel today. Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a very non-formal discussion with some of our graduate friends from Bohemia Interactive Simulations, which is located here in Orlando. Uh, the name of the panel is called Inside the Simu Simulation and Visualization Industry. You try saying that really fast in one sentence, okay? So anyway, I'm gonna bring the guys down uh, one at a time here and let me go ahead and start with um, a graduate from 2007. Jeez, you're old. Um, this is um, Andrew Rossiter, who's the senior software engineer. Next, we have a uh, junior software engineer uh, who graduated in 2013 from the game dev program. This is Brett Green. Also a junior software uh, engineer and um, Giannos, you just graduated, man. I mean, come on, this is Giannos Roman. <laughs> When did, when did you graduate? Was it 2014? Yeah, 2014. He's a real noob, so direct all your questions to him. And finally, um, our last guest, who is project manager uh, at Bohemia Interactive. It's, it's always great to have Liam back on campus. Liam actually worked here, and uh, for those of you that have gone through final project or are about to go through final project here at Full Sail, it wouldn't be without all the efforts of our good friend Liam Hislop. Liam's been around for so long, he graduated, what do we call the degree when you graduated? It was called Monopoly or something like that, because they didn't have like video games back then. Or it's called card building or something. Card building, that's <laughs> it, so. Welcome, you guys, thanks for coming back. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. How's, uh, how's everything out there? So my first question, um, and, and I'll direct this just to the panel here, um, to everybody is, how in the heck did you guys get the day off? <laughs> we got the day off? <laughs> we didn't. Okay, so I have to come in on Saturday. Yeah, in other words, you will be making up the time yeah. or you will be working late tonight. So thank you very much for, um, for coming in. We want to learn a little bit about the simulation industry. Um, when I started at Full Sail 10 years ago and first started talking with people uh, in the simulation world, the game development degree didn't seem to be taken very seriously by those in the simulation industry. And I think that was just a lack of them really knowing what was going on um, and, and not experiencing what it is that you guys do. Um, once we got a few graduates out there with companies like Bohemia and SAIC and, and uh, many of the, uh, I mean, there's just tons of companies out there. Um, once we got some people in there, just the avalanche started. So I guess, you know, I'm gonna start down at the end with Andrew and I'll ask you, you know, how, <clears throat> you know, how did it go your first day there? You were trained as a game developer, but you're going into simulation. I'm guessing there are a lot of similarities there. Well, I'm actually glad you said that. <clears throat> I, I came out, like I said, graduated 2007, and that was still back before the paradigm shift actually started happening between the traditional UCF style four-year education versus the more specialized full sale style education. And I will admit it was actually very difficult just coming out first there because a lot of those country or a lot of those companies were run with by people with the mentality that you have to have this UCF style degree program. Um, there were a few of us, um, a few of us that actually decided to take the plunge and go into Mill Sim. And I've noticed over the last eight years that I've actually been in the industry that people have been uh, embracing Full Sail more because of our more specialized type of degree program. The fact that we do more practical hands-on things at Full Sail uh, really kind of help, or help us become more prepared for the type of things that we're doing in Mill Sim. And I think everybody else has kind of started to embrace that as well. Excellent. And um, Liam, you're, you've been over there for uh, 
well, what have you been, has it been about a year now? Since Almost you, a year. Yeah, yeah, since you left Full Sail, where you were, you know, basically overseeing the final projects and doing a very similar job to what you're doing now. Tell us a little bit about your job at Bohemia and, and how it's similar or different than, than when you were leading uh, game development. Uh, in a lot of respects, it's the same. Uh, I think the biggest thing is the projects are the same. There's uh, obviously a little bit bigger stakes. Um, I have customers I have to answer and report to. Uh, and that, I think that's the biggest change is dealing with more customer facing. Uh, but as far as leading teams and helping guide teams, uh, making sure that they're getting their work done, making sure that uh, they're hitting their milestones, making sure that that's happening, that's all the same. Um, it didn't change much. And that was one of the actual reasons they brought me on is because we wanted to transition to more of a agile and scrub methodology, which we've been doing here at Full Sail in the game development department for three or four years at least Yeah. Um, before that. So they wanted to transfer more to that. So they brought me in to help kind of guide them. And so a lot of what I do day to day is a lot of the same. Got you. Everybody here, um, I assume we have <clears throat> primarily developers. Is everybody familiar with the agile yeah. scrum methodology for the most part? Can you give us just a, a quick recap? What, what does that mean maybe for those that aren't real familiar with that development methodology? It's a style of how you lead the team. Are you able to succinctly recap that for us? <laughs> I'm trying to think about how to do it quickly. Uh, it's, yeah, it's not really a methodology. It's more of a framework in getting projects done where you uh, inspect and adapt on what's going on. So you actually take what you're doing Every sprint, which is two to four weeks long, you look at the product, look at the process, inspect what's going right, inspect what's going wrong, and try and fix and make it better. So that way, by the time that you're at the end of the project, everything is awesome. And are you setting the schedules for your team? Um, nope. You know, in other words, okay, so there's another lead that's kind of doing nope. that. Nope. There's no, we don't set the schedules. The team sets their own schedules. Okay, awesome. And that includes art, all disciplines, art, design programming yep. and everything. I just tell them I want it done in two weeks and they get it done. Got ya. All right, so before we move on, you tyrant, uh, <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about what a typical day looks like for you. A um, uh, typical day, uh, I start come in and right now I'm managing three projects. So what I do first off is I go to three different stand-ups. Um, so I go to the stand-ups are basically just status meetings of what's going on. So I do that for the first hour and a half of my day. Uh, then I get to check emails and make sure that there's no fires going on. Uh, then I usually talk with some of the teams on some special assignments, uh, what's going on, any major issues, uh, questions we have on design related issues or uh, project status, things that we couldn't talk about or needed to have a more offline meeting about. Uh, Lunch and then afternoon is usually uh, paperwork and uh, more reporting with customers. So I usually try to do my customer meetings in the afternoon and paperwork, uh, meaning usually managing the financials of the projects, making sure that uh, everything's on track money-wise so that we're not losing or burning too much money. Yeah, we're gonna get back to that in a little bit yep. and, and talk a little bit about the customer interaction that, that you had mentioned earlier because I think that's something that a lot of us forget about, you know, as we're getting wrapped up in the fun and, and the challenges of making a game that, you know, you're actually making a game or a simulation for somebody who is funding that and they then become your boss. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I'm going to move down to Brett and I'm going to ask him the similar question. You know, what does a typical day look like for a, a software engineer at Bohemia Interactive? Okay, so in the morning I come in, um, review, uh, we use Jira for our task tracking. It's a pretty cool software. I think you can actually use it for free for smaller teams. But um, I come in, I look at, okay, what did I work on yesterday or the day before, kind of get that familiarized, put together my mental notes, and then we have a stand-up meeting. Those are nice and short, which is great. And then the rest of the day, I work on what I've got to work on. I talk to my team a lot and just get through tasks. Yeah, nice. Are you using a lot of the same technologies that you taught, that you were taught here at Full Sail, or um, do you guys use a lot of proprietary type stuff, or...? Uh, I think third-party third party libraries are very important. We use those a lot. Um, but also, most of my job is the fundamental stuff, knowing all the data structures, knowing when it's appropriate to use this pattern or that pattern, and just knowing how to program software in general. Excellent. And uh, John, same thing? 
Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I'd say we learned everything we had to learn here. Uh, one thing that was new for me was third-party libraries. We couldn't really like, have to use too many when I was here at Full Sail. And uh, Bohemia, like, we use third-party libraries for everything, so it's like a new thing, like, oh, you know. I used to like not trust it because I was like, oh, maybe it's unstable, or maybe I just had like a stigma against third-party libraries. But now I'm like, dude, it's all this free code. Like, what the heck? Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Nice. Um, I, I've heard, and and I guess I'll say this more as a statement than a question, and you can say true or false. But if you're a programmer, uh, a programmer who knows how to write code would be similar to an artist that knows how to paint. Whatever you whatever your medium that you use doesn't really matter if you're an artist. So you're trained here at Full Sail to use C++, and I'm assuming that's primarily what you're writing in uh, out there right now, but are you able to jump into other languages and whatnot rather quickly, or? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say definitely. Like, I know one big thing is like, oh, a lot of people like on the resume, they're like, oh, I know C++, I know this, I know this, I know that. I'm like, if you know like how to program, like all the languages, especially C-based languages, are all the same pretty much syntax, and. You know, we've, I've had to pick up MySQL and JavaScript and uh, Ada now, like a bunch of different programming languages that, I mean, it's all the same stuff pretty much. Like once you know how to program, you can program in a language, it's just different syntaxes and, you know, oh, this guy wants a semicolon, this guy wants a whatever, you know. It's, yeah. But yeah, programming's programming. Witty. Oh my God. Nice. <laughs> oh, witty. Be nice, Liam. Sorry. No. All right, so um, Andrew, I'm gonna jump back to you now. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about, I know that especially working with the military and whatnot, a lot of your projects you can't really discuss here or you'd have to kill everybody and we don't want that. Um, so tell us, you know, what, what can you talk about? I, want, I would like to hear a little bit about how the, the software that you're building, the simulations you're building, uh, utilize the, the technology and the techniques that you learned here at Full Sail. It, it's only tough because I'm trying to figure out what I can talk about yeah. and what I would have to kill everybody over. Um, <laughs> I, I want to say the one thing about Milsim in general is that you definitely get your feet wet in a lot of different aspects that you wouldn't normally have to get into with uh, specifically game development. Uh, because we're working with customers that are expecting a different type of fidelity, a different type of realism, you have to start accounting for things that you wouldn't normally have to account for. Um, one thing that I'm currently working on, for instance, is uh, being able to realistically simulate the propagation of radio signals, um, including how they interact with things such as reflecting off the ground, reflecting off of buildings, diffraction, refraction. Um, I don't think we have a course for that yet, do we? <laughs> no? Math. Um, I think yeah. it's called math. Yeah. It's, called math. <laughs> it's a lot of math, yeah. Uh, but actually, that's one of the great things about Milsim is the challenge of being able to embrace these new, like this is uncharted territory for pretty much everybody, and it's exciting to get into. Uh, as far as the technologies that you learn here, um, just really kind of, I, I would say, don't be afraid to specialize, but also focus on a little bit of everything. Uh, when I went through Full Sail, my focus was typically artificial intelligence and networking. Uh, from day one, when I got into the industry, it was graphics, <laughs> which I, you know, I, I paid attention just enough to get through the course. And <laughs> so it took me a little bit of time to recover, but you get the idea. Like, definitely make sure you know pretty much everything out there. Uh, because you never know what you're going to have to be tasked with, and a lot of these things kind of intermingle. Yeah. I hope that. Yeah, no, 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 that's, that's great. And I'm going to move right down the line and, and ask, you know, the same question. Anything to add on that? Um, I'd say the biggest thing is learning how to research for yourself, because as he mentioned, um, you're going to be doing something of everything. So learning how to go out there and look at something you've never seen before and go, okay, so this is how that works, or find a repository of knowledge. Because other people in the world have done that work before you, so spinning your wheels trying to figure out a new algorithm for something is silly when you can see what other people have done. And then the important part is that you don't really learn as much at Full Sail as taking that algorithm and putting it into your own code. How, is, uh, how are you guys set up as far as the design of your, of your simulations and the projects that you're working on? Do you have a separate design team? Uh, yes and no. So <clears throat> we do have designers. Um, our designers do uh, work on things like some of the interface. 
uh, but they're also looking more for scripting as well. Okay. So they have to have a little bit of design, a little bit of scripting. Um, we prefer them to know at least or be able to understand military uh, information. Uh, there's a lot of information out there, a lot of information. Um, and being able to do, like Brett said, to be able to do research uh, and ask questions and learn more is key. Um, we are always looking for um, different roles and responsibilities, but yeah, uh, we are, yeah, our design, it's, it's, like I said, we call it design, but it's not quote unquote design because yeah. there's a lot of scripting in, in, in there. In the traditional like, yeah. Um, sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we have, and they also are working with artists who are helping with the actual creation of some of the menus and, and interface uh, icons and that kind of such. Yeah. So you guys have a full art staff on on hand as well. Uh, I don't know if I'd say full, but yeah, we have an art staff. Yeah. We have about we have four or five guys. Okay. And and how many people total at Bohemia? Uh, in America or worldwide? In America, at, at your shop here in Orlando. Uh, I want to say like somewhere in there, 70, 60, 80. Or, sixty or seventy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> And are the majority of your projects military related? Yes. Yeah. What other kinds of things do you guys do other than military? Or anything that you could talk about? Uh, Doc. No. Just kidding. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, because I'm in the middle of working on a BD project, business development project that's non military related, but I can't talk about it. Understood. Man. Sorry. Oh, we want a scoop, man. I, I, no, I literally cannot talk no, about it. I, I signed know, the NDA. Just, I, I cannot I'm talk totally about it. Kidding. Yeah. I'm totally kidding. But, um, no, I, no, I signed an NDA from the customer, so I can't even, yeah. So it's not even like the, the Bohemia NDA. It's the customer NDA. Got yeah. 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 Okay, we'll talk after. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, it's what they call a friendy. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, I know that in talking with some of the other uh, the other companies that are out there, there's a lot of people that, um, uh, there's a lot more focus right now on um, like working with attorneys and creating uh, courtroom simulations for attorneys to uh, present their case to the jury. Um, yeah, we have a guy, really? a, a guy That's that cool. I work with actually has a side company that does that and um, it's pretty interesting. Um, a lot of uh, medical evacuation type trainings and, and different things like that are being done out there. So, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. I think for me, the thing that was real amazing um, when the simulation people did start coming around and really looking at our full sale guys um, uh, a little more deliberately was um, they realized once they got some of the game developers in that you guys were able to do things a lot faster and a lot more realistic. And that was the thing. Then you started talking money. And that's what made them pay attention, because if they could save money, then yeah, they wanted to talk to you guys. So um, I want to jump back to what we were saying earlier about the customer side. You do a lot of that, Liam. You're, you're handling the customers and everything, and you're meeting their demands and, and whatnot. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't, we don't have any alcohol here, so I don't mean to you know, scry, <laughs> you know, reopen a wound here, but um, yeah, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about you know, the dealings that you have with the customers. So people come to you and just say, hey, we need this made. Um, how, you know, what, how, how does that work out? Well, right now we've got uh, contracts with different military branches. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, contracts with United States military as well as military from around the world. Um, we are a multi-global national corporation. Um, so we have offices that are in Prague and the UK, Australia, uh, and Poland now, and I think moving to other places. But uh, we have contracts currently with like US Army, US Marine Corps. Um, and so working, I'm fortunate in the fact that my customers are really cool. Um, so what, who we work with are the actual training uh, sides. So they've got your military branches and every military branch has an actual training, a simulation and training department. Um, and what they're looking for is trying to simulate as much as possible how to train soldiers um, in virtual environments without using real world um, equipment. Uh, the reason being is, for example, if you have to fire off an artillery shell, uh, those things can run about $3,000 a piece. Uh, so if I have, if I mess it up or the soldier messes it up and they have to fire, you know, fire th three, four, five, six rounds in a day, that's kind of expensive. Whereas I can actually go into a simulation, fire it off and train on how to do it, you know, quicker, easier and much, much cheaper. 
Yeah. Um, Not to mention the safety factor. Yes. Yeah. That, is, that is the other thing, too, is, you know, they're having to fire these live rounds on their military bases, and, yeah, if you make a mistake, it, it could hit civilians. Yeah. Um, so their, their problems that they come to us with is they usually have uh, outfits or divisions that come to them and say, we want to get trained or we want to train our soldiers in this um, using virtual environments. How can we do it? Yeah. And then we try and solve that problem using our engine, our technology, and our knowledge. You know, God bless you guys, you know, helping keep our uh, military safe and out of harm's way and, and be, you know, well-trained. Um, is that something, um, it, you know, does Bohemia and, and other people in the industry look for military background in order to be considered for jobs? Uh, or do any of you guys have a military background? Yes, I do. Yeah? And did that help? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's actually funny because there is actually a, I, I'm, I'm from field artillery. By the way, anybody else military in the audience? Oh, I love this. Guys, you're in the right place, I'm going to tell you. This is definitely the panel you wanted to sit in on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I, I had a background in, in the military. I was a field artilleryman. So it's funny, Liam talked about all the stuff that we used to do, like live fires. Yeah, simulation, it's definitely cheaper and it's definitely effective training, but it's nowhere near as fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I got hired at uh, Bohemia. They actually had, uh, they, they knew I was military, but they didn't know exactly what branch. And they were actually working on a project that um, involves some type of stuff like involving artillery. And they had no idea that I was an artilleryman until someone just happened to find out in conversation. So that was fun. Um, yeah, I would say if you're if you have a military background and you want to go into milsim, definitely put it on your resume. They do look at that, and I, I yeah, would say helps. that it at least puts your foot in the door because you speak the language of their customers. Yep, and that's always important. And you also know that it's an alphabet soup worth of acronyms, and you're already used to that and able to handle it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that, See, that, the, every military person smiled when I said that. Yeah, that that I did not have a military background, and it literally took me two or three months to just learn. A lot of acronyms. I was researching military sites online to find out what all the acronyms meant. My first week, I decided to make like an acronyms.txt. Yeah. And I, just, I literally yeah, me too. Have, and I still add to it like yeah. weekly at least. Yeah, just right on. Brand new yeah, acronyms. me too. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Nice. It's it's ridiculous. Okay. Get that on. Yeah, I wasn't one of those Call of Duty people or anything, so I was kind of like fresh. I didn't have any military anything knowledge at all, but you know, I picked it up over time. So it's so, not well, it's not like super bad if you don't know anything at all about military. You'll you'll pick it up. Yeah. And you'll learn all the acronyms. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so so then I'm guessing that working in simulation was something like completely new then when yeah. you when you came to full sale, I know that your very first day here you were probably sitting in, in that chair in orientation and going, um Video you games. know, I'm gonna work out <laughs> GTA ten or whatever, yeah. you know. And so, are you happy with the choice you made? Yeah, I'd say Liam, definitely. Shut your ears, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say definitely. I, I, I remember being in, like, I think it was, like, OpenGL class, and um, Richard Wright, he was doing simulation stuff, and I, I don't know, I was, I was kind of like, you know, oh, no, I'm going to do games, you know, whatever, I'm going to do games, screw simulation, I'm going to do games. Um, and I can't, I haven't been in games, so I can't really compare it, but, uh, but I'll say, you know, I'm definitely satisfied with what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I imagine doing, I'm doing a lot of the same work. I, again, I can't compare it, but I'm very satisfied with what I'm doing. Nice. I know you guys are still actively playing games, right? Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> funny you said that, because when you mentioned the courtroom simulator a little while ago, for some reason, the word Phoenix Wright just came into my head. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I could think of. Nice. <laughs> Do you, that's good. That's good. So uh, a thing that I, I always like to ask, I, I, I go down to Brett. Um, mm -hmm. How, how do you keep up with all the new technology that comes out? I, I always, you guys amaze me, the programmers in general, you know, because things change so rapidly, and you guys are so well-versed at what you do, but it changes every day. But you're also working a full-time job. So how do you find time to keep up with everything? I mean, what, what do you do to, to stay on top of things and the changes in technology and everything? I would say the biggest thing is don't try and keep up on everything all the time because you'll lose your mind and be homeless. <laughs> um, but I do 15, 20 minutes a day. Just browse a couple aggregate sites. Look at, okay, what's happened in major tech? Are there any big conventions going on? Because that's when a lot of the really big changes will happen. And you can just get like a brief on, okay, what is this? What is that? But then throughout the rest of the year, you just 
kind of look around, read a couple articles every now and then. You don't have to know the super in-depth of everything, but you do need to know that it exists so that later, if something comes up and you need it, you can go find out the super in-depth thing. And if you're that's, Tim, you read the newspaper. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, man. I was going to say, and if you're Tim, you read the newspaper. We have, a, we have an employee who's like, <laughs> he still has a really, flip phone. he's against like, he, yeah, he has an old, like, non-smartphone. <laughs> he's pretty ridiculous. Yes, he has a dumb phone. I'm pretty sure he just reads the newspaper. <laughs> Also, don't like be afraid of copy. new tech. He's like, he's like, yeah, he's like a 24-year-old like curmudgeon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. No, I, I really like that answer, Brett, because um, I, I always say, you know, knowledge is power. And a lot of time during the day, I find myself just scanning through my aggregate reader, or um, I don't necessarily read every article that comes up, but it's nice to know the headlines, you know, so yep. you kind of know what's going on out there. Um, do you guys need to have a security clearance to work at, at Bohemia? No. Not yet. No? Um, <clears throat> you know, for some projects it helps, but it, it's not at all necessary. Yeah, if you have a clearance, it, it's... It's definitely yeah, a plus. It's a plus. Um, at this point, no, but in the future, maybe. Okay. And that's just, that's not necessarily the industry, that's just Bohemia. Correct. Okay. Some places you definitely have to have a security clearance before you start. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm getting a little surprised. <laughs> so, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, but it's because um, we're not dealing with a lot of the R&D for the technical stuff. We're doing the training. Okay. So we're doing simulation and training. So the training side of it, we try and keep it, and our customers try and keep it unclassified. So we've actually, and Andy's on one of the projects where we've run into some, gotten up to, up to some points where it gets to be classified, and they say, no, pull back and do X, Y, Z so it's not classified anymore. Um, so there's a line right now. Now, if that changes in the future, we'll see, but yeah, but so we try and keep it unclassified right now. I imagine, uh, <clears throat> total switch gears here, but I imagine you guys are pretty excited about all the virtual reality excitement that's going on in the industry, huh? Yeah, super cool. We, uh, Steven recently, he brought the DK2, which I hadn't used. Actually, I used it last year in GDC, but, uh. I know it's cool to see like VBS, and I was like, you know, walking around the plane and flying the jet, and like I was flying it forward and looking down. I'm not sure if we're gonna integrate that soon, but or how it's happening. But I know for a lot of us personally, tech. we're super excited about the tech because we are techies, we're programmers, we're gamers, we love all that. But the nice thing is, as he said, every now and then some of the bosses will bring in like some new tech because they're like, hey, can we leverage this as a thing? And so you get to play with something like the giant wraparound screen just for fun to see, okay, is this really something we can use? And it doesn't have to sit in my living room, which yeah. is nice. We, yeah. yeah, we do have some cool toys in our office. Nice. Yeah, we'll say that. Um, yeah, as far as VR goes, we have been experimenting with it. Um, and I've actually talked to some of the customers and the problem that we run into continually is, yeah, it's great, but we still have to solve real world problems that you don't think about. Um, and the biggest one that they brought to us, because we were talking about it and talking about different contracts, and he said, well, what they'd like to do is use VR to train their artillery forward observers. So basically you have the forward observers are, are spotting where they actually should be targeting and what they should be shooting, and Andy can correct me on that. Um, but uh, the problem is, is that at some point they have to write down what they're going to do and so they have a notebook. So in the real world, they're actually spotting. They take the binoculars down, they write it down. So if I have Oculus on my face and I have to write something down, do I, and if I pull the goggles off and do it, that's negative training. They don't want to do that. So we would have, if they were going to do that, we'd have to find a way to actually simulate looking down and writing wow. on a piece of paper. Yeah. So trying to solve real world problems that, like I said, I didn't even think about. I'm like, I have no clue that, oh crap, if we can't do that, we can't use it. Interesting. That's why they used to be I would imagine, and, and there's a lot of talk also in the industry right now about usability. It's really kind of like an up and coming discipline that I'm told in a few years time, there will be a huge demand for, you know, out there in the industry. How do you guys handle that uh, at Bohemia? Trial and error. <laughs> we have testers sometimes. Yeah. We have an amazing um, test team. Yeah. Yes. Like that is something that I love about working there is that our test team is on top of it all the time, and they will tell us this literally feels horrible. I click on this button and then I don't know what I'm doing, and they can respond with, 
here's how I think it might help, and we can take that to the customer and say, is this something you're looking for? Is this what you're looking at? So it, it really helps that we have people that we can rely on to give us that insight. Yeah. It's also nice, like, I remember one time that uh, one of the testers, like, he gave us uh, a bug report, and it was just, like, really, de like, it was detailed to the point where, like, I was like, oh, I just need to go to the sign of code and fix this. Thanks. And I told him that, and he was pretty happy about that. But, yeah. What kind of skills are needed for, for, like, you know, working in that area, you know, in the test side? What would, you know, for those interested in, in pursuing that? I'd say one thing that's helpful is just being very detailed with your reports because it's it's horrible when they're like, oh hey, this thing doesn't work, and it's like, oh thanks, good to know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. <clears throat> what exactly does? Yeah, exactly. It work? So like, I'm, I bring up that one instance where that one guy, I mean, he gave me a really good bug report to the point where I was like, oh, it's literally in this line of code. Like, it's very detailed. So yeah, it really helps out when you know they don't just skim over things. A propensity for breaking things doesn't really hurt either if you're going to be in testing. Well, and do the things and that you don't think the user is going to do just to see what it's going to do. And be able to reproduce set things those. into error. Yeah. Being able to reproduce those. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Not just break it, but I'm be sorry, able to reproduce it. Yeah. Being able to reproduce the breaking. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. So if I break it, knowing what steps I took to break it, being able to write those steps down, yeah. and then being able to communicate those steps to somebody else. How many projects do you typically have going at the same time? I'll let these guys talk about that. Uh, are you talking about per developer or yeah, the like entire you, company? Yeah, you in particular. Uh, I only work on one project. Okay. Um, typically our iterations, uh, well, as far as my experience with Bohemia, our iterations have been about a year. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we'll usually pick up a different project or work on some R&D kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I personally haven't had to work on multiple projects at once, but I know uh, like Rob and Tim have had to do that. And I mean, we try to keep away from that. Like whenever it does happen, you know, you know, Rob, for example, brought it up. He was like, dude, like, this is ridiculous, switching back and forth. And they, he brought it up, and, you know, he, they made it so that he could focus on one project. Yep. Words. I'm yep. probably the other end of the spectrum. I'm currently active on three projects. Um, two of them are internal, though, so it's a little different. I have my one major project that is 99% of my time. Um, the rest of the time, we get a free development time at every, I think it's every other Friday. We get a block of like four hours where it's just work on something that will help us or the company or you or whatever. Make like yourself, whatever you want? Make your, basically, it's a make yourself a better developer because better oh, developers right are better developers and they want you to improve. That's awesome. Um, but, so I'm working on several projects at the time, but most of my time is spent on the primary project and then any extra little odd hours. Like if something's compiling and it takes like 20 minutes, I can work on another thing for a little bit. Yeah. But it's, it's There seems to be one. a lot of stability in the simulation world. Andrew, you've yes. been there for, what, almost eight years now, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I talked to other people at various game companies, you know, the project's done, we shipped the game, and now we gotta lay half the studio off. You guys seem to continue, you know, getting new challenges and, mm -hmm. and new things presented to you all the time. Yeah, I think every company's different, but I've been fortunate enough to work for places that actually value their employees and. There's always, if you're a talented programmer and you have something to offer the company, they're not going to let you go just because your project is done. Yeah. Um, man, the game industry, them hours, though. Uh, yeah. I have never in my life worked 90 hours on a project. I have worked at most 67, and that was because someone else broke something really, really important, <laughs> and it was due the next week. Wow. That was going to be was my next week. question. My follow-up question actually had to do with crunch time. You guys don't see a lot of crunch time there. Well, don't be fooled. We, we do have crunch, just the difference is it's not planned. Yeah. It's not actually <laughs> baked into the schedule for the last three months of your project before release. So basically only when Brett breaks something is what you're saying. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, okay. Every other day or so. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I know well, Andy, the last project that Andy was on with me, we had to do some crunch on it, but there was a lot of extenuating circumstances that caused it. Um, that I want to get, I'm not going to get into, but yeah, that that caused a lot of problems and some crunch. I mean, but the crunch wasn't excessive. I mean, the guys weren't working, you know, a hundred billion hours. I think you no, guys you're talking a few weeks, and we yeah. weren't. We, I mean, if we had to stay past seven, that was a crunch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but since then, we've tried to fix that because so we don't have crunch because it's not good for anybody. Yeah. I actually worked during what we called the dark times. <laughs> we, had, um, we had about six months where a very large project was very far behind due to outside 
forces, basically. And so I was doing 55 hour weeks for a, a while there. But like since that ended, the first thing that our management did is said, that's never going to happen again. And since then, we've had one or two like super crazy extenuating circumstances, but it's never been near that excessive. How long ago was that? That that's was awesome. a year and a half ago. Yeah. That was, that was before and the reason they brought in project managers. Yep. Yeah. And they do good jobs. Four project managers. Actually, um, the dark times. yeah, the dark I'll times. publicly state that the, the, the vibe and the things that I hear since um, you guys have brought the project managers in, and, and Liam in particular, has, has really made a big difference there. Um, so it's kind of cool to, to hear things are going. Now, don't let your head get too big. Or oh, too late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, um, I hear really great things over there. Yeah, I broke my arm batting myself in the back. So Did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. I remember you used to do that here all the time. Yeah, I did that here a lot, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> how, how many of you guys are involved in hiring new candidates or interviewing new candidates that, that come there? All of us, technically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do a process where basically you come in, you're going to do a programming test. Uh, if you do well on the initial programming test, you go into our phone system where we'll call you or you'll call us. We set up a, a call basically and you do an interview where we're going to ask you basically technical questions. And the people who are in that phone interview rotate. We always make sure that people are rotating in and out of that. And it's always going to be people from two different levels. So we'll have a senior and a junior or a mid and a mid or a mid and a senior. We, we try and make sure it's nice and mixed. And then if you get past that, which is not bad as long as you know all of your fundamentals and you know what you're doing, then you come in for like a pair programming day where you hang out with someone who's uh, at your level of what you're going to do. And you also take the opportunity to talk to people and get to know it's kind of like you're, hey, is this person crazy? Yeah. Like we know they know their stuff, <laughs> but are they going to like stab someone or something? Yeah. So it, it's very much all of us are involved in the hiring process. It's actually kind of different from what I'm used to. Yeah, that's kind of cool. What yeah. characteristics do you look for? Um, I'm, I, is everybody out here, I'm assuming we have primarily programmers in the crowd? Yeah, we have, we have like artists, artists and well. stuff in here too. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Technical artists? So, um, yeah. wait, wait, wait. How many of you can write mail script? <laughs> no, I'm serious. So the, Not really, I, like. I, like last week I was talking with my artist, my lead artist and, and talking about some of the full cell stuff, and he's like, Does anyone, can anyone write mail script? And I'm like, I have no clue. He's like, they can, we'll, we'll, we'll look at hiring them. Like, okay. I'll throw, it out, I'll throw it out there. It, that has to do with Maya, right? Yes. Yeah. Nice job, nice, yeah, yeah, you're learning, nice, good, fantastic. I knew that, I just wanted to say it publicly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so what kind of characteristics do you guys look for in a, in a new candidate? What, you know, what, what makes a, a, a candidate stand out to you? I like the not crazy one. <laughs> Besides not being crazy. Oh. Can you be a little more specific? Well, I'll let them go because I have different criteria than what they do. Sure, so. sure, excellent. Yeah, from a, just from a programming side, like not talking about personality, but from a programming side, uh, a strong focus on the fundamentals. Um, like literally, like during our, our, phone com or our phone interview, the question, what is the keyword const used for? What is the keyword static used for? Like little simple things. Um, what is the time or what's the time complexity of this thing? So if you know big O notation, we'll ask you simple questions like that. Um, it's that's pretty much going to be the focus of what we're looking for from a um, just from a talent perspective, like the ability to understand the basics of C++. Uh, the part that uh, Brett didn't mention for mids and above is when you come in, we actually have a written interview uh -huh. or another set of written questions where we're going to ask you more questions involving things like um, uh, fundamental architecture or solving complex problems like how do you stream large amounts of data, stuff like that. Um, but in general, I mean, the gist of it is don't forget the basics. Like I know it's, you guys take, take data structures way early in the program, or at least you did when I was here. Uh, don't forget that stuff. So that's pretty much it. The other thing is, as, as you mentioned, there are very different requirements for different levels. If you're coming in as a junior, you're not expected to be a rock star programming god. They're expecting you to come in and know what you're doing so that they can say, hey, program me this function. I want it to take in this, put out that. And you guys get the book, The I think it's, I don't know what it's called now. Mine was blue. They changed colors. It's the one you get that has all of your data structures, all of your formats, vectors, and all that. Know that very well. Because even if you don't go into SIM, that will be one of your saving graces, is knowing and understanding the difference between the data structures 
and the difference between the keywords and why they matter and where you use them. Because all the other stuff, if you can learn, that's all they're looking for. They want someone who knows the basics and can learn to be a junior. Beyond that, it's obviously a lot more complicated. Cool. Liam. Solve my problems. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yep. Like, you know, Brett saying, you know, you don't have to be a rock star, you know, awesome person when you come in. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I, was I was trying to be nice. Um, no, you've got to be you a rock star when you come in. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that you have to be able to, to work leaps and bounds above everyone else. It means you have to work with everyone else. You have to be able to solve problems, ask the right questions. Um, don't be a drag on your team. Um, don't be the person that is causing everyone to have to rework stuff or the one that's asking the stupid questions six times. Um, I have people that ask stupid questions all the time, and yes, there are stupid questions. Um, the stupid questions are the ones I have to repeat myself. Um, and it's not because I'm a jerk, but because I've got four or five other projects I'm working on, and if I have to repeat myself again, uh, solve my problems. So I've got a lot of customers I'm working with, solve my problems. The guys up here are fantastic because they can solve problems. So they solve problems routinely really well. Also, uh, be flexible and be willing to learn new things. Um, yeah. I, I guess speaking from some other experiences I've had at uh, Bohemia uh, with other people that aren't with us any longer, um, I can tell you, like for example, don't argue with me about the coding standard. It is what it is. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. I, I know you like Hungarian notation, but we don't use it, so sorry. Um, <clears throat> but in general, just be willing to. Uh, just be willing to adapt to the changing conditions and yeah. don't be mean about it. Yeah, I that think, was, yeah, oh, go ahead, go. I was gonna say, that's one thing that was pretty annoying. Like, um, we, we had a new employee and he, like, it was literally like his second day. And one of the mids is, you know, helping him, we, like, we have like a mentor system where like you have a mentor who helps you out for the first couple of weeks and stuff and helps you like, you know, get set up in the code and our coding standards and how you figure out some problems. Cause at first, you know, you just have this giant engine. So they tell you, you know, where to start pretty much. And they kind of guide you for the first few weeks. And, it was like a second day and he was already like trying to correct like this mid who's been there for like three years. And it's like, dude, what are you doing? Like, you're just like, don't like you've been, he's been there three years. You've been there two days. Like just, you know, just sit back and learn for a bit at least like yeah, the, the play yeah. nice with others things is something that a lot of people, you're never going to get training for that in school. Um, especially as a programmer practice, take a, take a standard that you don't know, apply it like a coding standard and use it for a little while and then change to another one. And then whenever you go back to the things you wrote in the other one, practice writing in the standard of the thing that is already written. Because no one likes it when you go into code and you write something that looks completely different. But you're probably going to have to work with a lot of other people's stuff. And it's going to be written weirdly different from your stuff. And the only other thing is write code that don't be super efficient. No one cares that you saved three clock cycles. M write code that if you come back later and you just look at it and read it, you can get a sense for what it's doing. Because yeah. the compiler is way better at efficiency than you are. Yeah, and actually I'll jump on that a little bit about working with other people's stuff. So because we've been in business for a long time, we have a large code base and a large art base. Um, uh, we've got hundreds of thousands of models, characters, um, code, et cetera. If you can't work with those things, and some of them people are like, well, these look like crap. Well, then solve the problem. Well, uh, you know, I just want to, you know, that's what I'm supposed to do or, or this. Look, solve the problem. Um, you're like, well, I don't have time to do that. Well, whatever. Then don't bitch about it. You know, I understand there's, I understand there's problems. Nothing's perfect. But, you know, if you have time to work on some stuff, work on some stuff. We have, uh, some brown bag lunch, uh, uh, I don't know how, what, what we call it, but uh, where people will actually do some experimental R&D things in the engine for you know art and design and sometimes programming to show off really cool brand new things that we haven't thought about. Um, and we try and showcase those once every couple months and it's really cool. Yeah, I'll just say, um, like I remember there's one, this, this one designer that he, uh, Pretty much we had like those four hours on Friday at the end of the day to like work on side projects or, you know, like uh, brown bag stuff. So we had a designer who made like a security cam system for in VBS using like the scripts that he usually does day to day. And um, 
yeah, we actually like he presented that in brown bag in front of the entire company, and like we were actually thinking, of, you know, in screening that to one of the products. Yeah, several products. Actually. Well, yeah, because of that, we are actually looking at bidding on another project because of some of that technology that he did. That's the coolest part is wow. at any really good company, you're going to get to play sometimes because they want to have the people that are constantly working with their software develop new advances and new things that they can sell to people. Yeah. And remembering the whole time, you're not necessarily working on a game. So the goal is not necessarily to make it fun, but to make it practical and useful. Which is less like mysterious because fun is just like fun. You can measure practical and useful. <laughs> That's great advice, you guys. Um, I, I say it all the time too, and um, you know I think that it's important for developers or anybody in general to have a sense of confidence about themselves that they can find solutions to the problems. They might not know all the answers, and that's okay. Nobody expects you to know all the answers, but your ability to find the answer is what's important. How do you find the answer? You ask a lot of questions, not stupid ones though. And again, <laughs> stupid ones though are only the ones that you keep asking. Yep. Um, but yeah, you don't, you're not afraid to get involved. You ask the questions and you get involved and, um, and you're not afraid to learn. That's a, yeah, Josh Bass from Rockstar was out here, what, like about eight years ago. And I remember him yeah. saying, um, he put his own quote up on his slide, which was, if you are going to be in this industry, be prepared to be nothing more than a full-time student for the rest of your career. Um, yeah. So it's really cool to, um, to hear you guys kind of reiterate that, and 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 uh, it still holds tr still holds true eight years later. So, um, okay. So um, at this time, we're going to take a few questions from. Uh, we've been tweeting using um, the full sale on air hashtag, and uh, we can also get to a few questions here um, if you have them here in the audience. Um, if you have a question, um, raise your hand, and somebody will bring the mic to you. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with a couple of these um, that we have uh, uh, that were tweeted in. Uh, Kyle wants to know, when it comes to security within Bohemia Interactive, within the coding of your products, what tips can you offer toward upcoming companies also struggling with hackers, uh, et cetera? <laughs> uh, That's an IT. I have really I, good IT people. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we hired some really good IT people over the last six, eight months. So, I mean, we brought in Wayne and, and uh, I know John and a couple other people. And they forced us to change our passwords and inconvenience us all the time. But I know. For security reasons. Sucks. So whatever. Yeah. Now I have to have this weird, you know, like 38 character password that I can't ever with remember. Square brackets. With square brackets and backspace. Yeah. Mine has a smiley face on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you're an up-and-coming company, don't put your code on the internet. Yes. Oh, there you go. Keep your code on your own local server. Like, every, like we even transfer code like locally. We don't transfer it over Skype or something, even though we chat on Skype. Like, it's yeah. a lot of that kind Have of stuff. Have an internal Trick server pips. behind your firewall that you can play with. Yeah. So and be smart. That's it. We we normally don't like to double dip, but Kyle's got another good question, so I'm gonna go ahead and read that <sighs> as well. When Jeez, it comes Kyle. to simulation, since products are still designed to compete within the gaming market. How does Bohemia balance fun with what would normally be quite hellish realism? I like that term. Hellish. A lot of our games aren't really that fun inherently in the project we work on. Yeah. The framework as a whole is fun. Like what we do a thing called Tactical Thursday, where every Thursday a bunch of us get on and we play with our product. Because that is literally the best way ever to see, oh my goodness, that guy's arm flips backwards when he does this, that's terrible. Or hey, leaning around the wall is really awkward as a player. But fun is not the biggest thing in the sim industry. It's more about, as, as uh, Liam said earlier, precision. Because they don't care that the Jeep isn't super fun to drive as long as it is down to the centimeter exactly the right size and handles how it should in real life. Because you're prepping someone to drive the real life Jeep. Yeah, yeah no, I'll give you a great example. So we had, I don't know where the status of this one is, but uh, one of the customers came back and they had done some training and they wanted some fixes on one of our boats because they were having problems running through the simulation of loading and unloading cargo and people from the boats during an emergency uh, watercraft situation. It's not fun. It's not sexy or glamorous, I know. But they have to load up Humvees and cargo on the pallets in the water 
while things are happening, there's fires going on, um, people are manning guns around the boats. Um, yeah, and they need it to be realistic as far as what do you do? What do you do? I'll say some of the stuff is definitely cool though, like probably that's not the most glamorous, but. Yeah, it's the least um, glamorous one. The artillery stuff's pretty cool, like blowing stuff up, so. Yes, that's cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm doing right now and it's, it's fun to see blow stuff blow up even months later, so. Yeah, you yeah. know the, there's the Call of Duty mission where you have the C-130 above you, giving you support with the big guns. We get to actually play that just for fun and we get to like be on the lays and it, it actually works like it would really work as opposed to a game imagination of it, which can be a lot more fun because ours can track real objects. Yeah, and actually I think that's why our designers who are really awesome are kind of sick because when I talk to them about some of these things about making it realistic, they're like, oh, that's the awesomest thing in the world. And I'm like, what? That's no, boring. <laughs> but no, they love it. It's yeah. cool. So that's why they're awesome. Do we have any questions on the crowd? I see a few hands. Somebody's going to bring a mic around, I believe. Oh, he's going to make me move. All right. Um, how connected are you guys with the rest of the company? Because I know you said there's a location. I think the headquarters is in Prague. Um, they have locations in the UK you mentioned. Very. I was in Prague last month for two weeks. Yeah, we, we, we talked to the guys um, in the Prague office. We all, I mean, we just have a giant global Skype directory that we all communicate through. Um, and because we are primarily the, um, the plugins and the US specific contracts and they're primarily working on the engine itself, there's a lot of collaboration between us um, because we might need functionality for our, you know, our specific types of contracts that aren't necessarily in the engine. Um, so our stuff has to play nice with their stuff and that requires a lot of really close collaboration between the two teams. Yeah, one of my projects, I have US and Prague people both on it. So every morning we do Skype um, stand-ups and I do customer demonstrations online because the customer's actually in North Carolina. So yeah, there's a lot of virtual connectivity. So yeah, know your virtual connectivity tools as well. Okay, while you're bringing the mic around to the next guy, I'm gonna read one here. Um, this is a great question actually. Stevie Ray wants to know, is there an internal audio team or is audio contracted out? And then he follows up was where in the development process is audio implemented? It's a great question. Um, I think we've got uh, one audio person now um, in Prague, in Prague yeah. that is dedicated to looking at a lot of the problems that we've, we've had as far as we just grabbed a lot of sounds and put them in. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're going back and fixing a lot of them. Um, as far as where it happens in the pipeline, and not so much because we're using a lot of the sounds that are already in the engine. It, the audio for us is less of a thing because the engine is from a very long time ago. Yeah. It's, it's been updated and all, and there's an engineer who works on that, but it's not a part of our intrinsic pipeline. We don't necessarily change how the audio works. It works, and that's good enough. And it's being improved and everything. We're getting new sounds and all that, but the actual framework is not really a part of our pipeline like it would be in a game. Yeah, once you have an artillery uh, cannon that's firing off like a 155 or something like that, it, you have it. They all sound the same. When you make it shoot better, it still <laughs> sounds the same, so. Yeah. yeah. And, and the engine does all the work to make it sound correct for the environment and all that. That, that, that stuff has been done, so yeah. we don't have to do it constantly again. Sorry. Who's got the mic? You have one on each side. So oh, okay. Raise your hand, guys. Raise your hand. I know I saw I th I, hands Yeah, hands I thought I saw one or two there. over there. Don't be shy. Here we go. Uh, no, okay. No, oh, go ahead. Man. All right. Just go ask for questions. Um, I was just wondering about the the day to day work environment. I know you guys work on a lot of military sim stuff like that. Um, do you have a military day to day work environment, or is it more relaxed, or uh, just what's your day to day? Like? Dude, this is the only time this week I'm going to be wearing my tie. Yeah, this is yeah. the nicest clothes I've worn in like a couple months. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think our rules are like as long as you're not wearing flip flops, you're good to go. They, they actually hide the programmers from yes. everybody else because we are completely immature. I, I have a Nerf bow and arrow sitting at my desk. I have a um, two shot. It's really good. You put it in your top drawer, and then if someone attacks you, you can shoot them. Yeah, like our, our CEO came in one time with a uh, with one of those uh, drones, the parrot drones, and was like flying it around the office, and like he like showed us everything. So for us, um, particularly, it's very different at different companies, but um, typically business casual is pretty common. Um, in our company, because we're behind a locked biometric door that the customers can't get into, we can dress much more casually. But that is very much dependent on the company. 
I haven't seen any of our customers really do very heavy military style stuff. A lot of them are like, you'll have former military people, but that just means that they're more regimented workers. It doesn't typically extend over into the day to day of everybody. So is it like really fun, like when you get like a four star general that like comes into your office to like do a, a nerf ambush on him? <laughs> the, I always find yeah, the four stars are the guys that are like, I want to play the game. Yeah. <laughs> Put me in the jet and I'm going to bomb like this tank. Because <laughs> every other time they're usually followed around by an entourage of like 15 people. And those people aren't allowed in our building. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I wear this every day. <laughs> he's in the other building though. He's not. He's not in the dev building. I, I yeah. I deal with customers. I I'm on the other side of the building. I wear this every. There's day. that building and there's the fun building. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but ours is quiet. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, my question is about how flexible are you guys with hours? Do everybody come in for specific hours, or do they kind of get to choose their own? Like. They have to work eight hours a day or? Um, I, I can tell you that every every company in Milsim is going to be a little bit different. Um, I've come from places where they have uh, flex time or kind of like a, um, a set of core hours. Yeah. So every, we're expecting everybody, everybody to be here between 10 and 4. But as long as you work eight hours, that's somewhere overlaps at, that's OK. Uh, Bohemia, we are 8 to 5. We, we are in a weird transition phase. We were 7 to 5 and then every other Friday off before because Prague, um, but we're now standard eight to five, uh, but we do have a little bit of flexibility, but the official rules are eight to five. Yeah, but the, yeah, those may or may not change as we start getting yep. more global with our projects, for example, so we have to, and John is on the one, every Tuesday we have to be in at eight because we have a call with external customers in Sri Lanka, and so it's 5.30 p.m. their time. Yeah. So they're staying late while we get in early, so we have to be there on time. So it, it really depends on the company and the customers you're working with. Yeah. It's very different each time. But also, like, as you can see right now, like, we're here. We're going to make up the time. So, like, as long as you work 40 hours, I mean, you're going to make up the time. Fine, I'm not going to make up the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, you know, we have to go to this. That's <laughs> pretty flexible, I think. Yeah. So basically, Liam's on call 24 7. Yes. Um, if you guys have a pen, I'll give you his private cell phone right now, real quick. No, I got enough customers that have my private cell phone number. Thank you. And they do use it. And they do use it. <laughs> yes. That's why I like project management. They've stopped emailing and calling me, and now they email and call him. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, sir. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm in game dev in final project right now, the second month. Yeah. Right on. So we're in that moment that we need to get the resumes going. Uh, what you were talking about specialization, specializing in some field of gaming, right? My problem is that I like everything. So I, I, I would say I'm mostly in the, in the audience are like that. That's so great. I'm not very sure of what to put in my resume, right? I mean, I know that sometimes just, just put whatever they're looking for. So like if they're looking for graphics, you say like, hey, I like graphics, but then that may like uh, how you say limit your opportunities. So I would say, what is Bohemia looking for in the resume? What makes someone? What makes a resume stand out? Good question. No spelling mistakes. Yeah, yeah. that's huge. Yeah. Don't make sure your resume looks clean. Um, work with the career development department. They do this. Mm -hmm. I got. I sent out thousands of emails after I went to my GDC. No one ever responded to me because it was. I'm. I wasn't graduating soon enough. I guess. I got an email on a Saturday through career development from Bohemia. And then like the next week, I took the test and everything. And then two weeks later, I was hired. So we're looking for, you know your fundamentals. You know the data structures. You know all that jazz. But at the same time, if you're coming in as a junior, we're not looking for you to have a super developed. We know you don't, haven't necessarily had a job yet. Also, the fun part about our industry is that um, unlike most industries, there are way more jobs and there are competent people to fill them. Uh, we actually also have a you know, very quantitative way of judging whether or not you're able to do the job. We actually have our tests. We have mm -hmm. a whole bunch of metrics. We can actually grade you and actually say, okay, well, this person is talented enough to work here. So um, as far as the resume, just make sure it's a sync, make sure it lists your experience. Um, we look at that, but honestly, the test is much more important. Yeah, yeah and, and as far as like specialization, yeah, we're going to ask you to do a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. So you can specialize, but that doesn't guarantee that you're, I mean, we might bring in for something, but who knows? But yeah, pretty much, yeah, yeah, like I said, 
mostly I, I like I, AI. I do graphics. Yeah, mostly uh, talk with career dev, work with them. They know what the various companies are looking for. They'll know how to help tailor, tailor it a little bit. Yeah. Cool. I have one other question. I know this is the case for most um, simulation military companies. Like they only accept, and I, I understand why, they only accept American citizens. And right now I'm, I'm international, so I was wondering if Bohemia follows the same, the same concept of just accepting. Like, do you have a green card? Okay. No, do you have, you a, green have a green card? No. Okay. Okay, we, we only, I think, have one employee green card. Everyone else is U.S. citizen. Yeah. It is more difficult if you are not a U.S. citizen because of the nature of most of, a lot of our work is with U.S. militaries. But if you get a green card, um, that still qualifies you. Yeah. There will be some things you won't be able to work on, but it's not really. But the there are the locations worldwide where that's not. Yes. There so. are many locations around the world that yeah. still are looking for exactly the same thing we're looking for. So if you want to go to Prague. Yeah. I, I know the, I know there's openings in Prague. Yeah. <laughs> or is there anybody here that would want to marry this guy? Um, at, uh, <laughs> anyone? No? Okay. Remember, recently in Florida, gay marriages are okay. <laughs> All you devs looking out. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, we have a couple more. Uh, we got a little bit more time. If anybody, um, oh, somebody's pointing. Oh, there we go, back here. Oh, Hi. 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 Back. Hello. Right. Thank you for coming, guys. Hey, no My problem. name's Nicole, and I'm a recording arts graduate, and I'm in film production masters at the moment. But um, I know programming, and um, I also did some game impl implementation um, with audio. But uh, aside from all that, I wanted to ask you as a programmer, do you, um, are you certified or do you recertify yourself or do you not really care in this? My certification is I passed the test at the beginning <laughs> um, and then I get the tasks done. Um, we don't particularly rely on any sort of specific certifications because I there's not really a really good C++ certification. Oh, okay. Right now, I mean, we don't do any particular windows or anything, that tends to be more of a IT technical hardware stuff, I think. Yeah, I have to be certified though. He does. Yeah. Okay. It's like you said, if you pass the tests and you can solve our problems, I mean. Yeah, but for project management, yeah, you gotta be certified. So I'm going through a lot of the certifications right now. Is uh, those certifications there biannually? Uh, those are certifications for project management. And uh, so like PMP, um, I just got my product owner certification. So finishing, making sure you have your masters at least. Um, because we do deal with government contracts and they require that for the head of the contracts, but not necessarily who else is working on them. So for, any, for people who are working on programmers, artists, whatever, no, they don't require those certifications. We definitely want to see at least, you know, some sort of degree to know that you've done some schooling and graduated, but uh, yeah. If you can prove that you have those skills, that's really all we're looking for. Yeah. All right, thank you guys. Welcome. I think we have time for one more question. No, I saw two. Oh, those questions over there. You race. guys have to fight it out, yeah. and um, the um, winner gets to ask. No, um, there we go. Jake uh, can't speak, so okay. this okay. is his question. Okay, great. Um, simulation is a good way for training, but do you think that someday it'll be able to simulate the phys uh, physiological factors? Augmented reality. I know that there's definitely a lot of companies, medical, military, otherwise, looking into that. Yeah. Because, it, I mean, think you can not only save time. For example, we talked earlier when you fire an artillery shell, it's very expensive. Well, if you could save time on the whole having to have them run, do PT repeatedly and you could prep them, I don't think it's ever going to replace it until we get to, like, super robots or something. I don't know. But um, I do definitely think it will be, there are a lot of companies looking into that. That's a very vastly growing field that we're still on, like the wild, wild west of. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, especially for military, there will always be that tact or that you know tactile type type of hands-on training. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I can tell you my personal experience from going through basic training in AIT back in 1999. Uh, one of the things I had to do as a field artillery forward observer is kind of learn how our specific type of vehicle functioned. And the way that class was structured was essentially one guy pointing at things in an engine with like everybody kind of huddled around it. And I can tell you that from that standpoint, having a virtual mock-up of that vehicle that I can look at and actually touch or actually like click on things and see what they do would have been a lot better for, especially for retention. Because it's very hard to concentrate when you're the guy at the very back like trying to stick his head up, you know, trying to see over everybody else. Uh, somewhat related to that actually, I think that there's an event every year called ITSEC. 
and I believe students can go to that for free. Yes. It's in Orlando at the Orlando Convention Center. It's IT SEC. Look it up. December. It is the world military, like. It, it is always the week three. after Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. And it is the largest, uh, at least in the US, it's the largest military simulation and training technology type of um, trade show that's yeah. that you can get to. And, yep. and it's right here in our backyard. You'll see devs walking around. You'll see um, marketing people there showing off their products. It's a really cool way to both see all the stuff coming out in this field and actually meet a lot of the people that work in it day to day. Yeah. Four star generals, everybody. Yeah. Yeah, thank, yeah. Thank you guys for bringing that up. Um, it, it's an incredible conference and it is free. Yes. Um, there's, uh, I, I don't know if the entire thing is free, but I know there's at least one day where you can walk the days. floor and, and mingle with all the exhibitors um, and do a lot of networking. And um, I think we're going to need to end it there. And I just want to add this last thing. Um, when you were talking about the resume, the gentleman over here um, is a great question. But one of the things that you're going to hear from Will and I in career development all the time is, um, you know, yes, a resume is important. And I want everybody to understand that a resume is very important. At the same time, the more you're able to build connections with industry rock stars like these guys right here, the less important that resume becomes because you're leading with your reputation. And your reputation is the strongest currency that you possess. Yes. Your yeah. ability yeah. to connect with other people and to, um, to be able to get along with other people mm -hmm. Um, to be able to solve problems and to be able to um, continue learning as you grow as a professional in this industry uh, is what is most important. And I think these guys really adequately uh, uh, articulated that. Yeah. I will also jump on and say digital reputation as well. So making sure your LinkedIn, Facebook, all that sort of stuff, because we are going to check those. And, yeah, and don't absolutely. be a doofus on Twitter, because yeah. we will look at your Twitter, and if you're a doofus... <laughs> We and this, uh, this industry is also much, much smaller than you might think it is. Um, hey, I know that guy actually happens way more than you'd think. Yes, we will find for out. For good and for bad. <laughs> yeah, so we, keep that in mind. Your reputation <laughs> will both precede and follow. It's a Spanish Inquisition. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, for those that are interested, we are going to, um, we can have a little follow-up. Uh, probably we're going to be over kind of out, right outside of 3F. You guys all know where that is, right? If anybody no. wants to, um, uh, to come on out and say okay. hello um, and shake some hands and do a little bit of networking. Um, but man, I want to, uh, first off, I want to thank all you guys for coming out here today, both here uh, personally as well as everybody that joined us online. So give yourselves a big hand. You know, I've heard more applause at a golf tournament. That was like really sad. Eric, you're fired, man. You were supposed to be my guy. All right. Um, all right. So let's try it a little with a little bit more gusto now and uh, say thanks to our friends from Bohemia Interactive Simulation. Much better. Thank you all for coming, and um, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of Hall of Fame 6. There's a lot of great things happening, and uh, we'll see you guys around campus. Hi again, everybody. Uh, thanks again for uh, joining us online here. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, for this exclusive full sail on air moment with Liam Hislip from Bohemia Interactive Simulations. We have a few pre selected questions um, that have been tweeted in, and um, let's get right down to it. Okay. So, first off, what is one of the things that surprised you when you got into this industry? Uh, that's a good, great question. I think the biggest surprise was the amount of acronyms that were thrown at me. Uh, we talked about it a little bit before, but I literally had to learn every acronym that was thrown at me, and there were literally hundreds. Uh, I kept a notebook. 
I mean, I can talk about it and say, yeah, we have to deliver the TRR and the, you know, the SDD and the TRR for DVTE as we're going uh, on the AFATAD system. Yeah, it, it's crazy. The amount, that was, I think, what surprised me the most was just the amount of the, the language barrier on that. Absolutely. Uh, great question here. As an artist or animator prospecting and or applying to working at Bohemia Interactive, what would be the most awesome stuff they could put on a demo reel to cater specifically to Bohemia Interactive? Uh, great question. I would probably have to say, uh, so props, guns, vehicles, uh, and characters. Uh, those are the things we deal with. So weapons, um, even, sometimes even radios, uh, you know, real life props, uh, vehicles, uh, Humvees, boats, uh, giant boats, airplanes, uh, and characters. So we do have characters and we have people starting to work on animations for these characters, uh, but getting them to look awesome is, is, is fantastic. Great. Liam, thank you so much for uh, sticking around after for this uh, exclusive on-air uh, Q&A session. And thanks to everybody out there for p participating. <clears throat> Excuse me. We look forward to you being part of their next Full Sail on-air session. Have a great day. Thank you.